Welcome to Liberty Monks Podcast. James Mundy here with Mike Mundy. How's it going tonight, Brother Mike? Well, I'm looking at the hurricane coming in. Hurricane Ian is on its way. I'm in uh, Melbourne Beach, Florida, and we're about an hour away from a hurricane. So if I drop off the, the transmission, you'll know where I am. <laughs> I'll text you. I'm okay. Awesome. So, I didn't I didn't realize that. Yeah. It's on its way. Man, hopefully, uh, hopefully, uh, I know there's some places in Florida getting beat up pretty good right now. So hopefully, it doesn't. Uh, hopefully, it doesn't impact too many people. But it's a bit's a big one. So we're uh, we're obviously praying for everybody down there. So hopefully, you guys keep your power and everything's good. Awesome. I'm fine. I'm safe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Well, hey, listen. Um, this will be a fun conversation. Um, with everything going on in the world right now, uh, there's a lot of heavy hitting stuff. There's a lot of things that Mike and I have been exposed to and, and spoken with people about that just really is stuff. Some of the stuff's tough to hear. I mean, there's some people that come on and have, you know, you know, positive things to say, and that's great to hear some optimism, but there's also, there are a lot, there's a lot of things happening that aren't so great. And I know you gentlemen are definitely no strangers to some of those things, but today, you know, we wanted to talk about a specific topic that I know both historically and also, I guess, technically, both of you have a lot of knowledge about this topic, but in different ways, which we're kind of excited. That's why we wanted to have both of you on together. So um, first and foremost, uh, John Hamer wanted to welcome you back to Liberty Monks and Mark Sargent wanted to welcome you back as well, brother. Thanks. Thanks for having Thanks, me. Thanks, James. Good yeah. to be back. Very cool. Um, so just everybody listening right now, we want to be able to give you um, some background on these gentlemen. Okay, just real quick, just kind of, and guys, if you want to add anything into this, you're more than welcome to. Um, but John, uh, we've interviewed you uh, several times now and we've always had a great time with you. So many people in our audience know who you are. Um, but John is a full-time professional uh, geopolitical researcher, an analyst, public speaker, an author, um, he's written and published eight books and I've read uh, some of John's stuff. It's absolutely fantastic. But the ones that uh, come to mind here up front, um, the falsification of history, the falsification of science, uh, behind the curtain, which is a great book about our monetary system. Um, the, uh, JFK, a very British coup, the RMS Olympic, and you have a new book out, John, um, welcome to the masquerade, which I can tell you my dad read cover to cover. He's actually beat me to it. And, um, <laughs> He said, he said, very informative, also terrifying. <laughs> so, but he, uh, he yeah. was really into it. So we, uh, we appreciate yeah, yeah. the work that you do in that area. Thank you. That's a very, uh, very kind introduction. And then uh, the one and only Mark Sargent's with us also. Uh, Mark, big time truth seeker, featured in the 2018 Netflix documentary Behind the Curve. He's the author of Flat Earth Clues, The Sky's the Limit, and Flat Earth, Clu Earth Clues, End of the World. So... Yep. Um, Mark, also welcome back to Liberty Monks. And again, uh, learned a lot from seeing the things that you've put together. We interviewed you once before, and um, I had not seen Behind the Curve yet. Mike had, and I did watch it, and man, I just a uh, really good job. Uh, that was really informative documentary. Yes, it was. And, and again, I had nothing to do with the production of it, only that I should have had a producer credit, but whatever. Uh, it, it was made by an LA film team that hated us by the end of the time they got finished with it. By the way, I love, I love John's thing before we started recording where he goes, it's absolutely so he goes, so you're also into flat earth then, right? <laughs> I've never heard that. It's like, yeah, yeah. Done a few things. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sorry, mate. Sorry, mate. That's okay. I, I, that's awesome. No, that's great. Yeah, I, I love I mean, I've heard, you, I've heard your name before at very least, but I've never really looked into you, but so I, I do apologize. No, 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 don't, <laughs> don't. That's, that's one of the first times I've ever heard it. And it, it just goes to show you that, um, I mean, even though we, you know, our group has been doing it for seven years, there's still tons and tons of people that don't know that we've been doing anything on it. Right. So, right. Yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah. I mean, I do. I do plug into quite a few flat Earth channels on YouTube and Bitshoot and things like that. But uh, I can't say I've ever come across you visually. That's okay. uh, <laughs> what, what I try to tell people is, um, I, I am. If flat Earth was a university, then I would be the freshman recruiter. I'm the guy that right. gets you usually into the university. But then, right. by the time you're third year students. You, you're just forgotten, but you know, you know, those conversations you have in campus where it's like, oh yeah. yeah, when I first got here, I was into Mark Sargent, but here's the guy I'm into now. And so right, I was kind of, right. 
And it's like, all right, that's yeah, yeah. fine. So yeah. I did I did a conference last year. Sorry, we're getting off the topic a little bit. I'll just say this, then I'll let, I'll let you guys carry on. Yeah. Um, I did a conference last uh, back end of last year with a guy called Dave Murphy. Do you know Dave? Of course I know Dave Murphy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah, Dave and I had a good chat about stuff. Yeah, yeah. allegedly Dave and I hung out when uh, when I came over to your side and, and yeah. uh, did a conference thing over there. And yeah, no, Dave's right. great. Yeah, like yeah. Dave a lot. Sorry, diversion. no. That's no, a, no, that, hey, man. This was this is the reason why we wanted to do this because <laughs> just in our in our conversations with both of you guys, I mean, you you both have such a deep knowledge about a lot of different topics, and you know, every and not a lot of it is just. I mean, everything there's everything's a conspiracy theory, right? Until all of a sudden it becomes a spoiler alert, and that's what we've seen unveiled with COVID. That's what we've seen. I mean, we're the world is changing and and you guys both see that happening. People are waking up and they're waking up to a lot of different things. Definitely. And I think that a lot of this stuff is so heavy that it's very hard for people to hear it. But at the same time, there's some things that perhaps aren't so heavy that really pique your interest with some of these different conspiracies or even theories that, you know, maybe things haven't been proven that are out there. So everyone likes, I think, a good conspiracy theory because especially ones like, like I guess there's some outlandish ones, right, guys? There's like the Bigfoot, there's a Loch Ness Monster, Elvis is still alive. Who knows, right? But yeah. the, the, those are things that people oftentimes look at and they giggle and laugh like, oh, yeah, wouldn't that be great? Sure. But as time goes on and you as in, you know, investigative techniques improve and common sense starts to potentially take over, certain things start to become a lot more plausible, right? And so um, you guys just talked about Flat Earth and... I didn't. I I did not realize how gigantic that was until we ended up talking to Mark, and then obviously you start to look at th certain things and what a huge, just a gi gigantic amount of people that are in that camp. Oh, yeah. uh, I had no idea, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is incredible. Um, that that there's a lot yeah. that much research going on, and think people yeah. are starting to challenge things right right, right, right wrong or indifferent or true or not they're starting to challenge yeah. things i mean i do i do a stand-up talk call and i call it the three pillars mm -hmm. of fake science and i talk about uh, the big bang theory i talk about evolution and i talk about the globe earth and how those three things as a holistic view have been used to enslave us basically yeah. um so uh, you know it's, it's looking at the bigger picture and that's what i try to get people to do all the time is look at the bigger picture because so many people just focus in on individual elements of this huge conspiracy that is yeah. going on worldwide and I, I, that's what i try and do that's i feel that's my job to try and tie all that stuff together so yeah. very cool no um and again you know reading your stuff has been very informative and mark look at it into your, a lot of your things you've done a really good job of putting stuff together man you've done your research and <laughs> you know so this is what makes it so exciting to have you guys on because like mike and i you know we don't have the research and knowledge you guys do in these various topics we we're, we're pretty much doing a lot of the the stuff uh we're, we're interviewing a lot of people on a wide variety of things and learned a ton of information from that both good and bad i guess mm -hmm. but informative nonetheless helps you discern and think i think more critically and i think that's the whole point here right that's why we talk about these things how do we get people to do their own research if the, if something exactly. that interests them or impacts their life yeah. right which is yeah, great yeah. and i'm glad you gentlemen are here to do that so um you know one of the things that mike and i talk about a lot is and we've i've i've been in this camp for a long time is that the moon landing just seemed like it was impl not plausible when you actually look back and, and you see everything and you look at all the evidence. There's been so much conspiracy around that forever, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and also that brought brings into the space program too. Just a lot of people have started to wonder, like, yeah, is that they're making some stuff up here? Yeah, because some of it looks super fake. Like, yeah. And we'll get into some of this today, which we're excited to do. But I thought what would be a good way to start this, guys. And John, what we wanted to do is just kind of get you from a historical standpoint, like we just, you kind of just maybe uh, alluded to this a little bit, but um, as the resident historian, you know, in the geopolitical environment, if you take yourself back to 1969 and what right. was going on at that time, right. you know, I know you're not from this country, but you've done a ton of research on the United States and, and yeah. things that we didn't know. So. Sure. What what would give the USA the idea to fake the moon landing at that point? What was going on geopolitically that would give them that incentive if that's what they did? Well, the real big thing was um, the Vietnam War, which was a, a huge distraction, of course. Uh, you know, all, Apollo was it was a huge distraction from the Vietnam War. So that was kind of blindsiding people, I, I think. Um, but I also think, you know, it, it, the roots of it go a lot deeper than that. And, uh, you know, the actual formation of NASA I, I, I believe it was uh, uh, I believe it was formed or the ideas were originally mooted by by five specific people who were 
heavily into the occult. Okay. And that was Jack Parsons, uh, Alistair Crowley, who a lot of people have heard of, L. Ron Hubbard, who people know from the religion, Scientology, pseudo religion, uh, mm -hmm. Walt Disney, who everyone knows, and Werner von Braun. And the reason I, I mentioned those five guys is that they are all, in their own little ways, they weren't actually involved in the formation of NASA, but they were mo mooting ideas in the late 40s and early 50s about that kind of an organization. I mean, Jack Parsons set up something called JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So, he, mm -hmm. I mean, I think he ended up blowing himself up, actually, Jack Parsons, did he? Yeah. Was that, is that right, Mark? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. And and he also, there's also the inside joke is it's not just Jet Propulsion Laboratory, but Jack Parsons Laboratory. Yeah, exactly. Which yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Egomaniac. Yeah, Definitely. Yeah. So yeah, the roots go back to to the you know late forties, early fifties, and uh, I believe it, it it has an esoteric function um, because we know that these people love all this esoteric stuff and all this and all this you know uh, all this faker that, that, that they actually perform um, is is just it's just hoodwinking us and hoodwinking being a Freemasonic term and obviously it's con NASA now is controlled absolutely controlled by Freemasons, absolutely populated from floor to ceiling with high-ranking Freemasons, of which all the astronauts were part of, you know, that organisation. You know, all, all the mainstream famous astronauts were all, most of them were 33rd degree Masons, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what does that tell us about the, about the thing? So, yeah, um, I forgot what question you asked me now. Sorry, James. <laughs> That's all right, man. No, on. I mean, uh, we were just, I was, we were just wondering, just geo, you know, geopolitically. And oh, like, right, yeah. What, you know, what, you know, what would give that? the U.S. the idea to do this? What, what advantage did it give them, and what, what did it allow them to? There's, there's all you know. sorts of theories out there, and I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the Vietnam War, as I say, is a big one. Uh, obviously, there was, there was like national pride, patriotic prestige. You know, I believe. Uh, shoot me down if I'm wrong, but I believe that the Americans came to some agreement with the Russians. That the Russian, that then the Americans knew that the Russians had faked the Yuri Gagarin flight. You know, the, they knew that, and it was kind of a reciprocal thing. You know, you you have the first man into space. Um, we'll have the first man on the moon and just to compensate because that's a little bit lopsided but just to compensate we'll send you several million tons of grain every year which is exactly what went on yeah so that oh, was, a, it was a little of this for that yeah yeah, yeah exactly well yeah that that and so. if i if i could step in for a second you're, you're absolutely right by the way john yeah and don't forget that there was a problem with uh continuity meaning you couldn't have sooner or later these two programs, the, the Soviets and the, and the Americans, were going to be in the same place at the same time. Yeah. And you cannot have two studios working in different countries on the same project at the same time because nothing will line up. Yeah, good, and good, I mean, we, can, hell, we yeah. can't even do it here in Los Angeles. If you have two studios working on the same project, you would have a continuity issue. I mean, they could be within two blocks of each other. But if you have one group yeah. in Moscow and another in Air Force Base in, in Nevada, all of a sudden they're going to be like, say that 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 ash you know the ground doesn't look as brown as theirs or you know something yeah, that, yeah, yeah. nothing yeah. will line up so eventually they said look we have more money to do it on you know, we have the private sector we can we yeah. can make way more of a production out of it than you can you guys just step off the field and and we'll take it from here and, yeah good point good point and, and the space yeah. race that was didn't you yeah. know the, the 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 wonderful headlines you know time magazine had these great you know the space race you know cosmonauts versus astronauts mm -hmm. yeah. go 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 and then the americans get there first and the other side just quits yeah it's, it's like, crazy isn't it? right and, and the other thing of course is that um russia was way ahead in all the other departments apart from landing on the moon it, it was yeah. you know it was have the first man in space the first woman in space it was the first to do um yeah you know, what was the first to send animals into space oh um, yeah allegedly uh this is all allegedly by the way which is Im ought to be implicit in all this when I'm, while i'm talking this is what they're telling us right yeah. so yeah it, every single yeah. element the russians were way ahead of the states until that big blockbuster moon landing yeah uh, yeah yeah and, and, and it was and I, Sorry, go sorry, ahead. Mark, please. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead, you're good. No, I was just going to say, and, and, and just go back to the Vietnam connection as well. Um, every, 
every Apollo mission seemed to consi coincide with a, a major battle in, in the Vietnam War. And, and in fact, they, they cancelled the Apollo project, which was meant to have several more, more uh, missions uh, at the end of the project. Um, but they cancelled it immediately the Vietnam War ended. It was actually the same week or the same month or something. Uh, I can't remember the exact dates, but it was it was um, as soon as the Vietnam War came to an end, they cancelled all the remaining Apollo missions. You know, so, I mean, I don't believe in coincidence. That's absolutely crazy. You jump in on that? Yeah. The, the, um, no, yeah, you're right. And also, let me throw in one more thing. In, in that era, you know, the, the Vietnam War for us was, you know, the mid 60s into the early 70s. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, that was the only time you could fake something like that because uh, media was very, very limited. I mean, we were decades away from the Internet. We had three channels of television. Uh, yes. We had some radio, newspapers and magazines and people, you know, you could you could fake things to a certain degree. But I think even they realized by 1972 the limitations of how far they could go, because right. even even though we didn't need like the early, it was sad because there were people nerds, we'll just call them nerds, that were science nerds that were already deciphering what was going on with Apollo. And but the only outlet they, you know, if you're going to meet people and talk about it, the only thing you could do is go to like a UFO convention or a Star Trek yeah. convention or something like that. Very, very limited. And even sure. then they were sort of considered, you know, pseudo crackpots. Only when the internet started ramping up high speed did, did all this start changing. That's very true. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. nowadays, when a Kardashian um, does a bad Photoshop on her butt, people, millions of people know, right? Right. Yeah. Back then, <laughs> yeah. it was a grainy photo that no one has no, no even so, decipher. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, yeah. Well, you, well, you mentioned technology. So, I mean, how far we've come since that time right both in you know capabilities i mean hell now you can zoom in with these nikon cameras which is one of the things that people tools people use to challenge aspects right of what's going on based on what i learned from mark you know and john you too and some of the stuff that you've put together so i guess from that standpoint then is it i mean we've all a lot of us have gone down to the museums and seen the the stuff that went to the moon like it doesn't seem like it's even possible i mean is, is the technology did they have the technology is it even plausible that they had the technology to go there six times with what they had back then considering what you guys even just said about how how, how far how we've how far we've come since then it's an absolute joke i mean yeah. you know there is absolutely no way i mean even nasa admitted that they don't have, any, have the technology anymore i mean what does that tell you yeah. i mean that's just absolutely i mean that this is not me making this up. I mean, this is actual straight from the horse's mouth. NASA outright said they don't have the technology to go to the moon anymore, and it will take years and years to recreate it. I mean, we'll just think about that statement for a moment, folks. I mean, how ridiculous can you get? It's like someone saying, and this is a famous analogy, by the way, it's not me that's made this up, but it's like someone saying, um, you know, that someone invented a jetliner in the 1920s that could cross the cross the um, Atlantic in, in three hours or six hours, sorry. And then all of a sudden that technology goes missing and they can't recreate it again. I mean, what 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 are they telling us? They're telling us that, that, that it's it's just absolute nonsense, basically. You know, that, that I mean... The, when you get down to basics, I mean, of course they haven't been to the moon because the moon doesn't even exist in the way that most people believe it exists. You know, this is this is me with my flat flat Earth hat on. Um, but you know, so not only did they not have the technology, but it's not. I don't even believe it's possible to go to the moon. You know, because the moon doesn't exist in the way that people believe it does. So uh, I don't want to get too deep into that aspect of it. But, uh, you know, the whole concept is just ridiculous on its face. You know? it, it's funny. <laughs> that, what was that? I don't know. I think you're good, though. Go ahead. The um, uh, When I would do uh, speaking things and I would ask people specifically outside of this country, you know, inside the country, inside the U.S., it's like, oh, yeah, wave the flag, rah, rah, we're the greatest. That's, of course, why. In fact, there was a, a commentator on Fox News here which said a couple of years ago, she said, I believe in the moon landing because I'm a patriot. And it's like, okay, which means whatever the government tells us, you know, especially her, you know, if you're a true patriot, whatever the government says, that's absolute gospel. 
But outside of the country, I, I ask pe people, um, no matter where I go, but let's pick a country, Sweden. I ask people, it's like, why do you guys believe the Americans went to the moon? And they, everybody says the exact same thing. It's like, well, because it was on television. Yeah. <laughs> you mean the Americans put something on TV and it's absolutely bona fide, put in a certificate you can frame true. We would yeah. never lie about anything. We lie about everything. That's that means Batman doing. and Superman are real then, doesn't it? Of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but but I get it, which is no, yeah. was like, no, it was, it was, it was on the TV news. And it's like, because the news would never lie about anything. <laughs> you know, come on. And, yeah. This, I mean, this is the bad, big barrier that we have to get, get through, isn't it, with people to actually, this is like the first step, if, if you like, in convincing people about stuff like this. They have to get over that idea that the news never lies. You know, they, right. they have to understand that they are living in a, in a fake reality. We're all living in a fake rea reality yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's created largely by the media. Yeah, all the, you, from, from your homeland, all the world's a stage. Uh, yeah, we're all the players in it. And people have their own comfort zones. Everybody's, yeah. everybody's a little different. Everybody's got their own wheelhouse of things they're yeah. willing to look at and then outside of it, things they don't want to look at because it's uncomfortable. Exactly. And... and just on that on that topic, Mark, I, yeah. I was contacted this week uh, by a a well known truther in the UK to ask me to go on, on his um, on his podcast on his show, yeah. and we got chatting and he was saying I won't I won't name him for obvious reasons, but um, and he was saying you know we, we were chatting about stuff and and he just said, and I just said he said oh yeah he said your book falsification of history he said you know what kind of topics do you cover in there so I went through a few you know and uh, he said uh, oh. And then I said, and obviously the fake moon landings. And he said, don't you believe the moon landings are real? I said, <laughs> no, do you? He said, oh, yeah. He said, it's all, it's all misdirection, say, saying that the moon landings were, 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 were faked. He said, that's what they want us to believe. And I said, well, why would they want us to believe that? Or would they just love to give us the rabbit holes to go down, he said. I sort of just left it there. I thought I'm not going here anymore. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So and this so is he, this guy's a truther, you know. I mean and this But he but the Americans absolutely went. That that part's true. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean well, I live uh, about a half hour south of Cape Canaveral, so I watched the launches in our front lot yard. Yeah. But I took my kids to the museum a few years ago. I'd never seen the the lamb or other other stuff. And it is literally a piece of garbage. Oh yeah. It's sheet metal and like yeah, aluminum foil it. and that like curtain rods. I'm like, if that thing fell off that, that uh, brace, it would, it would shatter. Yeah. yeah. I, in my book, I, you know, when I, the, the bits that I've written mm -hmm. about it all, I actually say it looks like a, because I've seen it as well. I've been to uh, Kennedy Canaveral or whatever the hell it's called this week. And, um, you know, I just said that it looks like something a group of 10 year olds put together in an art class. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it does. was the the lamb the the lunar module that you see, you know, that you saw in all the photographs. That wasn't even supposed to be the one they were going to use. I um, happened to have the privilege when I was living in uh, Colorado. My next door neighbor, who his name was Wayne Ottinger, and he was the garage mechanic for NASA. He built the original lamb, which was a convertible, by the way. It wasn't even, you know, it wasn't even supposed to be this big encapsuled thing. And somewhere along the line, the, the narrative changed. It's like, no, 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 we got to make it something that they can stay down there and it'll be enclosed like a tent. But the original thing that they trained on for a while was a convertible version and never could really get it to work. And he wrote a book on it and, you know, he all the astronauts he knew on a first name basis. And I felt bad because this was when I just started getting into this, you know, the whole flutter thing. And his walls were just bristling with plaques and like lifetime achievement awards. He'd been retired for years from NASA. You know, you could tell this guy, but it's like, yeah, he was the mechanic. Of course he, he believed it. You know, they told him to build something. He built it. You know, it, it, he never, you know, never got to go to the moon himself. So he never, I, but I wasn't going to break it to him. I just couldn't because what, <laughs> it, seriously, he was already like 80 years old. It's like, man, right, I'm not going right. to do that to you. Yeah, it's yeah. not. It's not just but, not worth the effort, really, is it? Oh. Well, and even if I did, what, what happens then? He just curls up into a fetal position and, and never comes yeah. out. Yeah, It'd be awful. So, well, well and you guys made a really good point too. Um, when it comes to, regardless of, uh, you know, anything really beyond the fact that all the media we consume, what you guys just said, all the all the media we consume is owned by nine media conglomerates. Yeah, and if you actually examine. 
There's a great documentary. I don't know if you guys have seen this. Uh, Mike and I have shared this with a lot of people. It's called Monopoly, who really runs the world or really owns the world. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, that we interviewed a gentleman named David Sorensen, and he has that on his website. Uh, Tim uh, is the name of the gentleman who put the documentary together. But it walks people through. You can do this examination yourself. You can see that vast majority of every product and industry on earth is owned by the elite wealthy families. And if yeah. you actually examine yeah. all of that, they own the media too. And all the companies, it's either run by governments or it's run by private corporations that are owned by these people or, or, or extremely other wealthy people that obviously yeah. are in the same club. And so it isn't, I mean, I think the hardest thing for people to get their arms around guys is they hear these things and they can't get their arms around the fact that they've been lied to from the mass media almost predominantly since they started listening to it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the biggest disconnects. And when you start to peel back the onion on this, you start to see and realize, my gosh, it's, they do lie. They lie com implicitly. And once you see that, you can't unsee it. And right. <laughs> I think that's yeah. part of this awakening. I think part of, part of the reason why I think people are open to some of this stuff is because of that. And, and obviously the technology was atrocious back then. And then there's even rumors that, and maybe you guys can shed light on this, Mark. I don't, uh, both of you guys probably have knowledge around this, uh, but um, that, that it was actually Stanley Kubrick, the, you know, the famous director that actually helped them stage this. I mean, is that, oh, yeah. is that a believable thing? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's, yeah. and there's lots of, uh, lots of uh, evidence for that. Um you know, mass of this stuff, and I cover some of it in my book, but it, yeah. There's Sorry, a, Mark, carry on. No, no, it's okay. There's a great little inside story about Kubrick, which I love, and I, it's more myth, but I believe it, which was he, when he was doing um, Dr. Strangelove back in the day, he, came, he went to the government and he said, look, I'm, I'm shooting quite a, quite a few shots inside of B-52. Any chance I could, uh, you know, take a look around? And, and the government's like, yeah, no, <laughs> that's our state of the art plane, you know, back in the 60s. And it's like, you're not, you don't get to walk around there with a camera. Yeah. It's like, you know, Russia would pay top dollar for that sort of thing. And yeah. so somehow he cobbled it together from manuals and things, you know, he went out there and, and searched and, and he did all that without the government's help whatsoever. And so they came back to him later, you know, when they were looking for directors to see, you know, what they could go, do. It's like, look, this, look what this guy did with, with very little budget with a B-52 that we didn't give him. It's like, imagine what we could do if we get, wrote him a blank check. And so the story goes, you know, they wrote him a blank check for 2001 A Space Odyssey. And they said, you know, take as long as you want and see what you can fake in on film. You know, we'll get you anything you want. Yeah. And he took five years. And the, 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 the caveat was, he says, well, can I use some of the footage, some of my test stuff and turn it into a movie, kind of weave a plot around it? Mm. It's like, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. And uh, it, again, you probably know the rest of this. It turned into a nightmare for him because the government was breathing down his neck the entire time. Uh, and they, of course, made him do the whole non-disclosure thing. It's like, yeah, we were never here type thing. And he the the story if you want to watch a wonderful documentary called room 237 where kubrick built into the movie the shining which of course was originally written by stephen king he built yeah. in code his experience with the the moon project into that movie and uh it's that yeah. so nobody figured it out until the blu-ray version came out and they went frame by frame through the movie and they said oh my god and this was after kubrick had died you know kubrick died in 99 and uh, the you know all of it was laid out there. So anyway, sorry, I ramble. Yeah, well, I mean, the other thing about Kubrick, of course, is uh, and two thousand one of Space Odyssey is absolutely full of esoteric references. Yeah. Absolutely full. Um, you know, uh, the, the, some of you may remember the uh, legendary guy, legendary researcher Bill Cooper. Sure, who was, who was murdered by the FBI, of course. Yeah, on his yeah. own doorstep. Um, well, he he actually discussed that on one of his radio shows. I didn't see it live because it was a, it's a long time ago but it, uh, afterwards I, I heard clips of it and he, and he was talking about the the monolith within the film as, as like a symbolic catalyst for the beginning of the programming to control of humanity right. and how the monolith effectively imparts forbidden knowledge to humanity um, and um, yeah this forbid, forbidden knowledge leads to the death of one of the the apes in the in the Dawn of Man sequence, which is a famous film sequence with all the apes at, near the beginning. Right. And um, Cooper actually believed that the ape that was called Moonwatcher was a symbol of the first priest 
our initiate of the mystery schools and, it, and it, the, instrumental in guarding the secrets of the ages. Um, and he also highlighted the six transformations that the, the character Dave Bowman undergoes in the finale of the film and the sixth level of attainment in the mystery school teachings and the associated 666 paradigm of occult mm -hmm. teachings. Now, there are lots and lots of references, uh, subtle indications of 666 embedded into the film. And um, this is not my work, but it's a, a guy called Jay Widener. And if I may, I'm gonna read out a quote here because I think it's uh, really interesting. Okay, uh, it says, and I quote, it also appears that the monoliths in the movie appear for 666 seconds. The time between the first appearance and final appearance, final disappearance of each of the four monoliths added together is 666 seconds. Additionally, there are apparently 666 camera shots starting from the dawn of man to the end, the last shot of the closing credits. The running time of the film in seconds from the beginning of the overture to the end of the exit music is allegedly equal to the number of moon orbits contained in six, 666 years, which is 8903. Alternatively, the running time in seconds from the beginning of the MGM Lion logo to the fade out of the story is equal to the number of moon phases contained in 666 years. Everything before and after the movie proper, that is, the overture and credits and exit music times adds up to 666 seconds. For an added bonus, the director Stanley Kubrick was reported to have died on 7th of March, 1999, which was exactly 666 days before the commencement of the year 2001. Right, so... That just speaks volumes to me. Yeah. Um, you know, it, everything is, is, has got this esoteric level to it. And this is exactly what NASA is all about. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a manifestation of, of the elite's uh, beliefs in the ancient mystery schools and all, and all those teachings. So, you know, that sounds very plausible to me. Some people might think that's far-fetched, but I, it's very plausible to me. Yeah. Hey, let, me, yeah. let me go in a little into yeah. a little bit about the um the, the the question you threw a while ago, which was um you know did we have the technology to do it? We didn't have the technology to do it in any capacity, at all. I mean everything. Forget about the the onboard computers that absolutely couldn't have gotten us there. Uh, the the spacesuits, the the you know that were there. The 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 lem was which was a joke. The things I try to point out to people were the pictures were how they got away with it were. I mean, the, the, yeah, the grainy video, the television video was terrible, absolutely horrible. But the Time Life magazine photos were gorgeous. I mean, they were magazine quality. You know, mm -hmm. the, you, could, you could ask, uh, um, you know, film studios to do still shots. And that's what they would do. But the problem was they ran into, you know, to get those great shots, you had, they didn't know anything about physics. So they used, you know, stage lighting to do it and the lighting was one of the big giveaways but again because people don't know anything especially when you get out of school here about physics or lighting like the, the shadows intersecting impossible with a with a, a one light source that's 93 million miles away or there's you know no blast crater underneath uh, the the lem at all you know perfect four inches of dust everywhere and nobody got a shovel and dug down to see how deep the dust was it's just uniform everywhere um no feats of strength you know one sixth earth's gravity so a 180 pound man would weigh 30 pounds and yet, you know, the vertical leap was almost non-existent. You know, they, you, yeah. you could have lifted yeah, yeah. The, the moon buggy with one hand if you wanted to. Um, but the big thing for me, which was a challenge I put out there for like three years, which was the spacesuits. That was the part that threw me because if you watch, and this is not classified information, you could watch the uh, early nasa stuff in the mid 60s about the the you know how they were building stuff and the spacesuits were huge and clunky and they they looked like something out of 60s <coughs> doc doctor who where you know made out of plastic and metal and it was like yeah these guys aren't gonna be able to move at all it's like forget about climbing a ladder and then somebody one of the most brilliant stage moves ever somebody said yeah we'll just use a soft suit 
that's what we'll do. We'll just use a freaking soft suit, like, you know, like a, like a motorcycle suit, a glorified thing. And people and the, you know, the nerds in the background, it's like, that's not going to work in a vacuum. A soft suit would just, you know, turn into a parade float and they tip over and die. And it's like, no, no, we'll just use it. We'll, we'll make up something and no one will, no one will, will know the difference. And that's how, how it worked. I put the challenge out to any scientists out there for years. I said, loan me. You can even just have me come into a university, put me in a vacuum chamber with one of your suits and tell me what is in that magical backpack of the space suit that would keep me from dying. Tell me what's in there. No one can even explain it. They just gloss over it. It's like, oh, no, it works. I'm going, what? It defies all laws of physics. To, Absolutely. To do, to do that. <laughs> I mean, the, sorry, the, the law of physics, let me get this one more point in, which is the law of physics says that pressure cannot exist next to non-pressure without a barrier cannot exist meaning you know if you have a vacuum over here and yeah. you know air over here the, it'll equalize instantly i mean exactly. some sub guys will tell you um underwater uh, oil rig guys will, will tell you that and yet the and if it's a soft suit you look up any youtube video anything in a vacuum chamber football basketball yeah. whatever it is will just inflate until it bursts the only yeah. object that's never ever done that is a space suit and it's like what how why and and even if you could do it, you know, now in 2022, how'd you do it in 1969? How? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How, how, how? And, and the technology that must have existed within that space suit is just, is just mind boggling, you know, because the temperature of the, of the moon is, oh yeah, I, I don't know the exact figures, but it's something like plus 200 degrees centigrade in sunlight. Yeah. And then if you step into the shadow, it's like minus 273 degrees. Oh yeah. You know, it, and how could it actually switch from the one to the other so quickly? I mean, the, the cooling and heating technology in those suits must have just been absolutely mind blowing. There was there was one more thing that got me, and I didn't figure this one out until a couple of years ago, which was there was if you know anyone that scuba dives, the 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 one thing that will tell you the the primary thing any scuba diver will tell you what they look at is how much air they have left. They got a wristwatch, a, you know, I have a gauge in their hand at all times. They know exactly how many minutes of air that they have left. Go ahead and check the audio on any of the moon missions that happened with Apollo. No one cares about how much air is left. You never hear that come up. It's like, oh yeah, you only got 20 minutes of air left, Bob. I know it's not Bob. You know, we should head back now, right? You know, we should we should head back now. Yeah. That's all you would be caring about. The 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 lack of safety protocols. I mean, yes, we know that like airline people, when you're on a plane, you know, the, the guys in front of the air, you know, they, they, they talk really calm because, you know, they, they want to come off. They don't want to spook anybody, right? You, they panic, I'm sure, sometimes too, but they don't get on the intercom and tell you. If you're on the moon, if it's actually, you know, if you're actually on the moon, all you'd care about is not dying. That's all you'd care about. You wouldn't care. It's like, you're not going to play golf. You're not going to be, be making jokes. You'd be scared out of your mind. And yeah. plus you'd also, you'd be, you'd be like, yeah, we're, we shouldn't probably stay out here much longer. I only got, I got eight minutes of air left. We got to get in. Right. Yeah. No yeah, one yeah. would care about anything else. And yet the, the yeah. backpacks had unlimited air at all That's times. Right. Not, not to mention, sorry, one more thing, the <laughs> nitrogen, which is, we're breathing. What we're breathing in right now is only 20% oxygen, right? It's 20% oxygen, 80% nit nitrogen. We'll take the trace gases, throw those out for a second. Yeah. Where did they store all the nitrogen? You know, because and you say, well, no, you can't use pure oxygen. Anything over 40% oxygen becomes toxic, which is why, you know, the scuba divers are really careful about their, their oxygen mixture. No one, not only Apollo, but the ISS. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, I mean, the other thing that struck me about, and you kind of just touched on it there, Mark, was the fact that they were, how long were they on the moon? Was it they were, Was it between two and three days they were yeah. actually there? Yeah. I mean, how the hell, can you imagine the amount of battery power that would be needed to, you know, make all the life support systems function? Not yeah. only the life support systems, but everything, everything must have been driven by batteries. Yeah. And, you know, the battery technology in those days was just, you know, you would have needed batteries the size of the, the lunar module itself to actually, yeah. you know, fulfill that function. And yeah. also, uh, what, what I was going to say that you kind of obliquely referred to, and that is the fact that they were there for two or three days. Yeah. And there would have been, I mean, if it, that, that had been me, all I would have been worried about was how the heck are we going to get back home? Yeah. This has never been tested uh, on the moon for right. obvious reasons. So how do we know it's going to work first time when we try and take off? And then we've got a dock with the um, with the, um, the, the module, 
the module, uh, yeah. which is travel, just happens to be traveling at 4,000 miles an hour around the moon. You know, how are we going to do that? You know, yeah, lot, most Americans don't even know that module even was there. They just think that they jettisoned off with a little yeah. thing and, yeah. and flew back. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. They linked up with a ship that was in geostationary orbit. And then that ship came back. I'm going, do you know how incredibly difficult that would be? And, and to your battery point, the the when I was looking up, you know, there's a wonderful pictures of the, the satellite dish, right? It's that's just a straight up VHF transmitter that's running off car battery from uh oh, who's sharing you, screen? You, you oh, yeah, yeah, the the, the yeah. um, the the lamp, the lamp, by the way, the uh, the shot which you're going to show, which is the camera. Okay, so yeah. this is a remote control camera. There's two guys in supposedly in this thing, and th that thing's going to take off. Of course, it, this is just a model. And, and the wires are going are, are gonna to go. But you'll notice how it tilts up. The camera follows it. And it's like, okay, who's running the camera? NASA yeah. says that they were running it remotely from, from the, the space center. It's like, well, that's awfully good. How do you account for the eight-second delay, you know, in controls? It's like, oh, we got lucky. Really? Lucky the first time? Perfectly the first time you lined it up? You lined up that yeah. shot? And, and talking and about the eight-second delay, Mark, you, again, yeah. you raise a great point there. Uh, what about the interview with Nixon and oh. Armstrong and Aldrin? <laughs> you yeah, know, it was just a normal conversation. There was no delay at all. No, no. And it's like, yeah. And I, I, I mean, I understand the technology. You can patch it through the White House phone. I get that. But, but you're right. What, what happened to the eight second delay? It yeah. wasn't there. But again, because people wanted it's the suspension of disbelief. People wanted, did not want the eight second delay. Eight second delay is a massive delay. And that would have been a really, really awkward conversation. So yeah. you just get rid of the delay and the American public doesn't realize it's like, well, you know, they, we just wave it off. We, we yeah, don't yeah. even, we haven't even talked about it. The VHF transmitter was pumping out. I mean, you look up the, the, the things on that transmitter. It maybe had a range of 50 miles back in the day, maybe. Yeah. And that's Morse yeah. code. And this thing was pumping out 10 frames of color video a second and perfect two-way communication it's like oh no it was going to the lem and then the lem was going to earth it's like that's even worse even then so now you're lining up two things the lem has perfect you know and what what power is the lem running off of oh it was just the whole thing is just crazy yeah. isn't it when you think about it let's, yeah. let's, let, we should jump to artemis because um uh john doesn't know much about this and this will this is going to come up eventually so Every president in the United States has vowed since Reagan has said, you know, we've got a wonderful uh, montage of, of different presidents, you know, committed. We're going back to the moon, going back. I mean, you know, Reagan, Clinton, you know, Bush Sr., Clinton, Bush Jr., Obama, Trump. Everybody said the same thing. It's like, oh, we're going back to the moon. I'm like, okay, yeah, uh -huh, when? And then the Artemis Project started out. And it is, they, they supposedly were going to send uh, an unmanned capsule around the moon it was supposed to happen last month but something happened there was a fuel leak whatever you know and, and so it's still on the pad in fact it's still it's still in the garage right now and they're going to roll it out here in uh, a few more weeks supposedly although the hurricane may have a chance to uh, delay that even further we'll see but they are swear they swear they are going to first the first one's going to be unmanned around the moon you know just to just to take shots and then the, they're going to eventually land people and they, they claim the first person is going to be a woman whatever that's neither here nor there but for me, that is something I have said for years, which is if I was a producer, let's say I'm a director, right? You know, budding director in Hollywood, you could drive up an entire dump truck full of money to me and say, okay, we're going to do the same deal with Kubrick, but you got to fake the moon mission now. It'd be like, what? <laughs> Are you out of your mind? The internet would tear it apart. You can't, it would have to be flawless, absolutely flawless and that does not happen. Every movie, every production house that's ever been done, they make mistakes that, because everything's shot out of a sequence. You never, you will never be able to do it. All it takes is one guy in his underwear and at 3 a.m. in the middle of Nebraska, you know, look, it's like, hey, that doesn't look right. I'm going to post this. And that's it. It's, it. it's it's game over. I mean, that was the reason yeah. why they um they got rid of the what, stars. What do you mean? This you, is real? You're talking about? Oh, the Tesla Roadster in space? This looks 100% real. <laughs> yeah so the tesla okay let me go off on the tesla roaster in space so the, the roaster in space oh freaking must there you go yeah so that thing's got three hd cameras on it right running running full at all times and 
yet and there's a couple things that aren't happening here one this is a car just out of his garage apparently and the <laughs> the hazards of space the climate of space did nothing to this car the, the windows didn't spider web from the temperature changes uh the pressurized systems didn't explode the tires didn't explode nothing happened i mean this thing should have been a freaking mess it was flawless it was just beautiful this beautiful car you know what I noticed more than anything when I was staring at that car? Well, other than the fact that when it was dumped off, the Falcon Heavy rocket was nowhere to be seen. He was like, okay, there's the booster, there's the booster, and cut the car. And it's like, okay, where's the Falcon Heavy? Where, where's the actual main rocket? Shouldn't that thing be tumbling in the background? They weren't going to spend the money for that. That's fine. What got me was you can run that footage as many times as you want. There's no logos. This is SpaceX and Tesla. That thing should have been wall-to-wall -wall advertising. That's what we do here. And that thing should have been a giant, it should have been like NASCAR, should have been just stickers, just been brands everywhere. Why, why not? In fact, why didn't Tesla put a banner of that shot? You know, one of the beautiful shots in every dealership, every Tesla dealership in the world. Or, or I don't know, sell the rights to, um, you remember they were using the, the convertible, the red convertible. Why didn't they use the mm -hmm. flagship four-seater? You could have put, hell, sold the whole thing to Disney, put, uh, I don't know, Stormtrooper, Boba Fett, Groot, and Iron Man. Thing would have paid for itself. It would have absolutely been flawless. And then after that, sorry, one more thing. I know I ramble. No other car company decided to do that after that. It's like the first car in space. No, no, no one thought of that. And then so Chevy, Ford, you know, and nobody from GM or Cadillac, nobody, nobody decided to do that. It's like they just downplayed the whole thing. I think. I think that was a test in real time to see what social media would do. And they saw way too many hashtag not buying it, hashtag fake, hashtag hoax, hashtag get the hell out of here. Yeah, it kind of went away. Yeah, it just kind of went away. And yeah. that's why they didn't, didn't want to put as many. I mean, even the, the generic dummy there was just, just no branding on him at all. It was just stupid. Just stupid. <laughs> anyway. People, people say to me, I guess this goes for you too, Mark. Yeah. People say to me, you know, you know, well, you know, how, how could it, if it, if it was a hoax, how could they possibly have kept it secret from all the thousands of people involved in this huge project? And, you know, my answer to that is that, well, are you aware of something called compartmentalization? Yeah. Yeah. You know, whereby, you, you know, you, you get told things on a need to know basis and you don't necessarily have contact with anybody else in any part of the, you know, the, the entire setup. Right. You know, right. I, I suspect there were only around, you know, 50 to 100 very senior people yep. involved yeah. in the hoax. And they were probably under very, you know, great duress as oh, well oh, not yeah. to blow the whistle. I mean, there have been whistleblowers um, come forward. But the problem, and that's another thing, you know, people said to me, well, there would have been whistleblowers by the 100 coming forward. I said, yeah, well, there have been whistleblowers that have come forward. But the problem is with whistleblowers, they don't actually get a platform. No. They might get an alternative media platform, which is watched by maybe 100 people, no. but they no. don't get a mainstream platform. If they got a mainstream platform, then this would have leaked out into the open a long, long time ago, and it would all be in tatters by now. So, yeah, I mean, that is a very common criticism of, um, you know, a, a debunk of the debunk of the of moon landings, if you know what I mean. So, you know, that, that's, that's how I personally handle that. And, and you know, that's a valid, uh, a valid explanation, I believe. Did, I, you're absolutely right. Did you ever see the movie uh, Capricorn 1? Yep. Okay. That's a great movie, though. Yeah. One, it, what I try to tell people, I go, the, out of NASA, 99.9% .9 of the people in NASA don't need to know anything. However, exactly. there is a group of guys that do need to know, and that's the telemetry guys. The yeah. guys that tell you where the rocket is once you can't see it anymore. You know, those mm -hmm. guys is where it is in, in space. It's like, mm -hmm. well, it's 100 miles this way and 200 miles that way. It's traveling at this sort of speed. Those mm -hmm. guys have to fake it. And there was this wonderful scene, which just haunts me to this day, where one of the telemetry guys in NASA ran his own program. And he's like, it doesn't make any sense, right? That's he right. Talking, yeah. He was talking to his reporter friend in a bar right? Yeah. This shows you how closely they were being watched. And he goes, he goes, the transmission couldn't have been coming from 70 miles away, right? And within seconds, a phone call at the bar, fake phone call, the reporter goes there, he comes back to the table, his friend is gone. You never see him again. This guy's been erased from life. He goes exactly. to his apartment, and there's somebody else renting his apartment, and all the labels on the magazine are correct to the, label, to the lady who's yes. in there. Like, he never yeah. existed. And I'm going... It's like, it's like people don't understand. It's like if they 
yeah, if they want to, what's the what's the line? Uh, they can throw you, a, you know, uh, uh, lock you in a room and throw away the room. You know, they, yes, they, they that's very not. true. And talking about the telemetry data as well, of course, um, it came to light a few years ago um, that um, I know you know this, Mark, but it's just, you know, for the benefit of the viewers and listeners. Yeah. Um, 700 boxes yeah. of telemetry data went missing. Yeah. And NASA said, uh, oh, well, the, there was a tape shortage in the mid, early 18, 1980s and we had to overwrite it all. Yeah. Yeah, the historical documents of, this, of, the, of our civilization and they just... Of yeah. the greatest achievement by man ever in the yeah. history of mankind. And they yeah. just decided to overwrite the tapes because there was a tape shortage. I mean, what the hell is a tape shortage yes. anyway? <laughs> I mean, well, people don't even ask basic questions like that, do they? It's, it's, you mean, it's what do you mean a tape shortage? What's that? And yeah, because because NASA couldn't call up the tape people and say make us more tape. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. There was there was one more thing to your point, which was um, there was an older movie back in the day called um, Robert Redford movie called um, Three Days of the Condor. Oh yeah, so and which was a brilliant movie, CIA on CIA yeah. crime, which is just yeah. it was just a spooky movie. No yeah. play on words there. And uh, <laughs> at the end, it was a great scene where you know it was to your point. It's like well, if you were a whistleblower. Who would you go to, right? Because exactly. he goes to the he he dumps his thing to the New York Times and his boss sees him do it. And and he goes, Yeah, he goes, I did it. And he goes, and his boss says, How do you know they'll run it? He goes, They'll run it. And he goes, How do you know? Which meant he's going, We have people everywhere. You know, mm -hmm. we own the media. So yeah. if you put that, if you made sure that the people in question knew this, let's say, let's say you were an astronaut, right? You know, be, not that they're you know their emails are and phone calls they were monitored extremely well anyway but let's say you're an astronaut and you want to whistleblow you got one shot at this who do you go to exactly who do you call do you, do you call up the bbc do you call up cnn do you call up fox because once you do that it might be the last phone call you ever make yeah and if you get the wrong guy you know you know because there's this <laughs> chain of producers of one it's like, oh yeah, we were waiting for this one. You're not running yeah. that story, and then yeah, that's yeah. it. And then all of a sudden, astronaut dies in single car accident. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Those guys, I'm sure. Are yeah. Involved. Speaking of which, um, there was the famous incident of Pete Conrad, who was going to go, you know, one of the ex astronauts, right. who was going to go uh, public on the 40th anniversary in 1999, and then uh, a week before that happened, he was uh, killed in a, a motorcycle accident. Yeah. Very unfortunate. Just a coincidence, though, of course. Nothing to worry about. You know. Secrets can be kept. Despite what people say, secrets absolutely can be kept. Yeah. Um, it's just a question of, of um, you know, if you're willing to, willing to believe it. I mean, of course, the old example, the Manhattan Project in the United States, you know, the whole atomic weapons program here. That was kept a secret, mostly because of compartmentalization. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to something like the, the space program, yeah, if only a tiny, tiny people know exactly what's going on, that's how mm -hmm. you want it anyway, because everybody else could pass lie detector tests, including yeah. like, you know, Neil Tyson. Great one. People say, oh, Neil Tyson knows. Like, no, he doesn't. I like, go, oh, you, you keep him absolutely in the dark. You want him on stage being fresh, being, being sharp. You don't want him anything weighing on his mind. It means he's not even a, a scientist, as far as I can tell. He's just an actor. He is. He is. He's a great salesman he in fact yeah. he just stumbled he could have sold anything he could have gone in, into uh, motivational speaking or anything like that he's got that stage presence yeah but yeah. he lucked out where it's like and also throw that in there there's only three media scientists in the world right now um neil tyson from the united states brian bill, cox bill nye the science guy no we'll get we'll, <laughs> i'll mention him in a second brian cox from the uk yeah. michio kaku from japan yeah i'll speak english by the way and yes. then, yeah, they'll throw in Bill Nye, you know, just to piss me off <laughs> because he is so <laughs> he is so horrible. I mean, because he's from my neck of the woods. He's from Seattle. He was a he was a, um, a low rent actor who happened to luck out and get this show. Disney was looking for a new Sesame Street time th type thing. And he did some skits up here called Bill Nye, the science guy. It's like, well, he doesn't swear. He's not off color. Let's use him. And it was syndicated and. <laughs> all these producers i've talked to producers field producers they say why do you keep putting him on television he doesn't know anything about quantum mechanics he doesn't know anything about the ozone layer he certainly doesn't know anything about the mars rover it's like yeah but he looks the part 
It's like, oh, you gotta be kidding you got me, me. You got me there because he does. He's angular. He wears a lab coat very well. And that's it. And so they put them because everybody that has an actual PhD, you put them on camera and they're super dry. It's like, yes, I would agree with that. You know, and they just <laughs> and the producers are screaming and they have to like, get them to talk. Give it a talk. Bill, Bill Nye's an actor. So, yeah. And yet he gets to go to the White House, hang out with Obama and Neil Tyson. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Anyway. So well, there always has to be a downside, doesn't it? Yeah. Hanging about with the Obama. Huh? Well, yeah, there's that. <laughs> you were uh you were getting into the Artemis project. Um yeah, I, yeah, I think and so so the Artemis project is supposed to look for it. So the Artemis is the new moon project, it's the new Apollo. Okay. And I don't believe this thing's gonna get off the pad. I don't. They've they've kicked it down the, the road uh two or three times already supposedly that they're treating it like the the new apollo it was like the first one's going to be unmanned and then they're going to land people it's like nope nope i don't think so because it is way too it it, it you know that apollo can be faked in the 60s you can't fake apollo now it right. cannot be done it not not realistically there's way too many people with you know they're very good at computers they can look and just stare at they'll just they will they will go frame by frame and they'll look and they'll look and they'll look it's like aha there it is right there i'm going to tell all my friends it, and then then the gig's up i mean the let's let's not forget um every movie that's been made there's there's websites out there called moviemistakes.com i'll mention one just off the top of it people don't remember this the original lord of the rings when the 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 first one when they were leaving the shire there's a white car driving off into the distance in the corner of the frame, you know, making a turn, you know, because they shot this thing in New Zealand. Nobody caught it. Nobody caught it. I mean, this thing went through all the way through pre and post production and it was in the theaters. And then somebody's like, hey, look at that. <laughs> so what, you know, it, you try to fake a moon mission now, you try to use Artemis to, to fake an American space program now, it, it, I would be scared out of my mind. I, you could you'd be the most famous director ever to be like, because they know it's the weak link in the chain that's going to throw you. And once it's on the, everything on the internet sticks. So no, the Artemis program is never going to work. They'll blow it. They'll blow that thing up on the pad before they, before they let that thing go. Uh, even, even the, the dry run around the moon, because you have to have HD footage. Everything's HD now. This isn't yeah. some grainy thing you can pull off in the 1960s. You know, you have no excuse. It's like, there's 4k cameras on this thing. So how are you going to fake 4K camera footage convincingly around the moon? And when you're coming back, you're going to have to have Earth, you know, somewhere. It's, you know, it's never, ever happened. Sorry, sorry, one more thing, which is there's never been a piece of space footage ever that has shown, um, you know, when, when, you're, um, when a rock is taking off, that the Earth, you know, as you're leaving the Earth, that, that the Earth forms into a ball. It's never happened in the history of space footage, ever. Statistically speaking, that's, that's impossible. But they're going to try to do this with, with Artemis. Yeah. No, never, ever going to happen. So, yeah. so gentlemen, um, so what, what is the purpose then? Like, I mean, obviously it's becoming harder and harder for them. If that's indeed what's going on, they're having a difficult time to your point, which might explain this huge delay in going back there, uh, which you're right. I do remember president saying every one of them, we're going back, we're going back and it never really happens, which, yeah. you know, and then, you, know, you run across certain things on 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 just YouTube and Rumble and whatever talking about. You know, you start to see th your point. You start to see discrepancies even when they do some of the space station stuff. We've seen videos of of that that looks really sketchy too. Um, I mean, is that in your estimation? Is are they also faking that too? I mean, is the is what the because, ISS right? Oh yeah, no, the ISS yeah. is is is, is B is B rate production value. And that's being generous. They make mistakes uh, on the ISS that that I'm I'm a little surprised they even air it. And I know part of it is because of of um, the the timing, which is they love to do stuff for school kids over here. Which is oh, we're gonna have our class talk to their people on the ISS. We're gonna do it yeah. live. It's like <laughs> any producer will tell you. It's like yeah, never ever do it live. Ever ever ever. It's just a nightmare. Yeah, and they make horrible mistakes. I mean, the, the we we've dissected it six ways from Sunday. Um, one of my favorites. Forget about the the green screen technology necessarily, or the layers that get screwed up. Um, would be just simple things like the hair 
you know, the, the women's oh, hair. The big afros they got going on? Yeah, yeah. They, their hair, they do the Bride of Frankenstein where the, they, they perm the hair straight up to try to make it look like, oh, that's what it is in zero G. It's like, no, no, it would be like in a swimming pool. It'd be like all over the place. It'd be like Medusa's snakes. Yeah. And they, they never, they never, and so, and I'm really surprised. It's like, all you have to do is get around that is to either um, wear a hat, tie it back with a ponytail, or I don't know, here's the big one, never ever have hair on the ISS because it would clog all the filters. And yet, you know, they want to make people look, you know, it's a, it's a shiny, happy, you know, wonderful yeah. thing up there. Everybody's smiling and no, no. Yeah. I mean, there's so many exposure video videos uh, oh, yeah. on, on these flat earth channels, isn't there? You know, showing how they, how they, you know, they do that tumbling motion, don't they? Yeah. They never go from side to side. It's always this neat, um, you know, 180, 360 degree tumble, yeah. uh, fully upright. And, and when you, and sometimes they make mistakes and you can see the cords, can't you, on the, on the waist and, yep. you know, and the fact that they are actually in, in like a kind of a harness. Yep. And, and I also saw one the other day, uh, which obviously I'm not quite sure how the technology works, but they must have some kind of feed, some kind of video feed, because... Uh, somebody told me that these guys that, that the photographing have some kind of contact lens or something yeah. that, where they can actually hold these objects or, you know, look as though they're holding these objects, but they're not really there. It's a separate video feed. So this, this one guy had, had these two objects and he could actually look as though he was holding them because he can see them through his contact lenses or whatever the technology. Yeah. And I can't remember what it was now, but it was a light object and a heavy object. And first of all, he was messing about, you know, making them float up in the air and that, and catching them again. And then he said, now look what happens when I drop them. And he dropped dropped them both simultaneously. Yeah. And the yeah. lighter one just kind of, just, just kind of hovered there. <laughs> and the feed must have collapsed or something. I don't know what <laughs> happened, but the heavy one just went bonk onto the floor. <laughs> And he was like, oh, and then he was fiddling for the switch to try and switch it off. It was obviously a live transmission. And oh, yeah. Somebody yeah. had actually caught it and, and you know, it was just fakery from the top. Yeah, they, the they, make, they make huge mistakes all the time. The general public doesn't, because the general public doesn't understand most aspects of science, they just kind of, it's like, oh, that was weird. Or they blame it on some sort of video glitch. Yeah. You know, all sorts of weird things happen with yeah. televisions nowadays. I mean, who knows? Um, but yeah, you're you're absolutely right. It's, Cognitive dissonance. It's, isn't it? it's not. It, well, here I'll throw one more out. It's not even not even the interior, just the exterior of it. Uh, I remember um, a guy that specialized in industrial valves. Uh, he goes, "There's only like three or four companies in the world, and they they really sell primarily to military, like submarines and stuff like that." And he goes, "He goes, how is this thing even working up there?" He's going, he's going, he goes, "Submarines, re, re, you know." Uh, the whole thing, the, the whole concept of submarines revolves around huge amounts of pressure, but it's opposite up in space, right? You've got this massive vacuum, pure vacuum around this thing. He goes, but it's made out of aluminum and plastic. He's going, the pressure, he goes, the, the, the air inside that thing would just rip that thing to shreds, the, 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 the pressure differential from the outside. He goes, plus you'd need a full-blown machine shop in the ISS just to make the parts because they have to be that's why he goes a lot of people don't know that like navy ships all have a machine shop on the ship so they can make parts you know because it has to be extremely precise he goes yeah. where there's a machine shop up there and plus even if you did how are you going to run it? it you know it takes huge amounts of energy and creates massive amounts of smoke and it, they're extremely heavy you'd never be able to get the thing up there he's going so where how are they even running it but they you know they 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 rely on the ignorance of the general public and it's worked. It's worked for decades. You know, people just like, well, it's on the news and there, there they are. So it must be working somehow. It's like, can you explain how? No, but somehow. Mm, yeah. That's good enough for, you know, Joe Lunchbox on the street. So that's fine. Well, well, gentlemen, I know we're running up against it. So I have a, just a, I have a couple more things I wanted to, to okay. ask each of you. And um, one of them is just John, just, if, if all the stuff we just talked about, what do you think then the primary purpose of the space program is at this point? It, you know, because they're still launching stuff up there and they're still doing things, right? Mike lives by the Cape and he sees stuff rocketing I up watch all, the them time. all the time. They're glorious. So what's the, yeah, what right. is the, what is, what is the purpose of this at this point? Um, well, I think, I think it, you know, there's more than one purpose. I mean, I think one person, one purpose is obviously it costs, 
a great deal less to fake all this stuff than it does to actually really do it. So there is a big there's a big hole in the budget somewhere. You know, there's there's, there's money being siphoned off, and I suspect that might be going in, into black projects. But I also believe I think the, the the bigger picture, and this this is my you know holistic view of it all, if you like, I believe that they are actually trying to prove to us. You know the things like um, well that the, the space actually exists when it in that form when it, when it doesn't. Uh, I don't know what the answer to that is, so don't ask me. But it, I, it, the, the holistic view, from my point of view, is that um, they pretend that the Earth is a globe and that space is in the actual form that it is with all these galaxies and and um, you know solar systems and all the rest, because the ultimate aim of these people is to deny the existence of a creator. Yeah. And that, you know, if we were just one spinning ball in space among trillions upon quadrillions of other spinning balls in space, then it kind of denies the idea of a creator. Um, and, it, and it kind of makes us, it turns us into uh, random little specks of nothingness that have just somehow appeared, uh, as I say, by random. And it, and it kind of denies us our spirituality and it denies us our power. It turns us from the powerful spiritual beings that we actually are into just basically, as I say, little specks of nothingness that are totally ins insignificant and a, ra and a random cosmic accident. So it's about, as I, I keep using this word, but it's this holistic view of everything and that and they're trying to they're trying to deny us our birthright, if you like. Well, when, you look, when, you, when you look at them, intelligent spiritual beings and powerful ones at that, which denies our power, in other words. Sorry, it was a very long winded answer. No, that's okay. Yeah. I was just going to say, when you, when you look at all the, um, uh, when you look at everything uh, that you guys just talked about, a lot of it makes logical sense. Mm -hmm. But when you frame it that way and you talk about they're hiding God, and then you, when again, when you've done as much looking into as you guys and, and uh, you know, things that Mike and I have heard, and you see the, the extent that they will take, the things that they will do to hide God from people, <laughs> this all of a sudden becomes even more plausible, regardless of everything that we just talked about, right? Because all that stuff, again, has elements of truth behind it. And there's questions more than anything, like prove this yeah. and they can't. Yeah. Um, but they hide God everywhere. They had they they try their damnedest to hide God, and um, so that's that's an interesting point that you just made because it, even in movies they try to make you feel insignificant, don't they? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's all about them retaining their power over us, basically. Yeah. Well, Mark, you got to be pretty glad though that I mean, uh, there's obviously asteroids and coming at us. You got to be pretty happy that NASA's got the planetary defense uh, deal going, right? It's got to be pretty. <laughs> you got to be pretty pumped up. I've I yeah the 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 Dart program which which is an absolute joke because they let somebody take creative license and create an asteroid which has never been seen before because everything that NASA talk about it's right here <laughs> NASA's everything that NASA's shown us and movies have shown us is that asteroids are one big rock right it's a solid rock but this thing looks like a collection of rocks that was put together with a combination of play-doh and confectionery sugar and maybe some <laughs> uh drywall texturing uh that and then you know make it gray for color and They're about to save us yeah this thing supposedly is the what a couple football fields wide and we're hitting it the, they call the dart project uh you know that we're hitting this with a satellite you know you're hitting a bullet with another bullet deep in space six million miles away and yeah, you, and, you and don't the, forget that, you know, in our solar system, we're hurtling through space at a million miles an hour. Yeah. Or whatever the figure is. And all and all the other different solar systems and, and uh, galaxies are, are traveling at incredibly mind boggling speeds. How on earth do they coordinate all those movements together right. to actually hit something like that, as you say, like two football fields? Uh, I mean, the first thing that struck me is why the hell would they want to do that in the first place? You know, what right. is the point? Right, right, right. I mean, 20, 20 something years ago when the movies Deep Impact and Armageddon came out. Yeah, that's when you would roll something like this out. But we're yeah. way past that. We're decades yeah. past that. And it's like, so now you're thinking of deflecting asteroids. It's, it's just another space reinforcement story. Exactly. Um, every time. Exactly. 
the, the only thing that made this different from every other asteroid story that ever ran by, and by the way, I just laugh at the asteroid stories because they're every every month yeah. now. It's like, oh, yeah, near yeah. Earth asteroid, near Earth asteroid. Yeah. And then this thing, it's like, oh, we're going to deflect an asteroid. It's like, now you have the technology to to do this sort of thing. And and you hit it with pinpoint accuracy. So imagine that's it's it's over now. So now you can send rockets to it like yeah. you did in the movies. And yeah. I mean, again, the, the other uh, possible reason for them doing this, it, it, it's more fear porn, isn't it? It, it makes us scared. Yeah. yeah. You know, so... so you know that's that, you know that's not the ultimate reason, but it's a kind of a, a, a nice byproduct for them. You know, when when I will start getting worried is, and I put this challenge out to people. I said, look, there's something along the order of six billion smartphones in the world, and yet there is no footage of an asteroid or meteor impacting anything. Mm -hmm. Now you can you can say, oh, there's a crater here and a crater there. Oh yeah, yeah, fine. There's a crater here and a crater there. Show me something real time, even in the water, because remember if. if it's mostly water you're gonna you know some no nobody in a fishing boat ever saw anything fly overhead and land in the water land on a mountain land in the trees somewhere six billion smartphones nothing and it's like oh no we'll see a, you know shooting stars here and there yeah 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 follow it somebody show me something yeah it's like, no no i'm never I, that's the one good thing about saying that we're living in some sort of building uh is that we're not you know we're not under any threat Everything yeah. that NASA is telling you, the fear porn, it's, it's not real. No, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And by the way, to, to John's point, he, he's absolutely right about hiding God. Uh, in fact, it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I made a clue back in 2015 called They Are Hiding, Cl they Are Hiding God. Right. Uh, mostly okay. because of the pressure from the Christian community that came at me. It's like, you can't dance around this issue anymore. You got to talk about it. It's like, <laughs> okay, fine, I will. Um, but to add something that maybe you didn't, which was, the, the the highest order of power right now on this world in this world is the government right unless there is evidence that we are living in a structure or a building that was built by something bigger than the government and if that's the case the government immediately loses huge amounts of credibility they're not going to do that not voluntarily anyway so if they yeah, have evidence they, they have proof to say you know let's say we're the government and, and all of a sudden you see a giant structure, you know, something, a big supporting beam behind them. People would be, be like, yeah, we're not going to listen to you as much anymore. We want to talk to those guys. And the government loses, loses power. They're not going to do it. They're not. So hiding God and, uh, and, you know, making it look like we're just some accident, some residue left over from the Big Bang. They're going to yeah. keep that going as long as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, gentlemen, I uh, I, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, go I ahead. I was just going to say, I, I totally debunked the Big Bang as well in my in my uh, book, Falsification of Science. Cool. You know, I, I see them, the Big Bang and evolution and the globe Earth as being, as I say, the three pillars that they build this this entire fake reality of science upon. And, uh, you know, it's all absolute nonsense from top to bottom, every single last punctuation mark in it yeah it's just yeah. utter utter nonsense agreed well gentlemen this has been awesome um uh great uh, it's it's great to get you guys together in the same virtual room anyway it's been uh really cool hearing uh the information that you guys know and hey just for people that are looking to find out more about the work you guys do i mean you guys are out uh you know like i said you're you're you're, you're fighting the fight in your way and we're doing it in ours and uh I think we're all in agreement that war has been waged on the world from, you know, in a lot of different angles and people just have to be in reality. Right. And it's a different war. Right. Um, so war of minds and war of information and war of data. And uh, if you control the data, you can control people. And that's and certainly what this seems like that's the powers that we have been trying to do for a long time. So where can people find more about your work, John, you know, uh, how can they find your books okay. and anything yeah. that you put together, maybe, you know, other, other podcasts that you do, where can they find more information? Sure. Well, all, all my podcasts, there's links to all my podcasts on my website, which is falsificationofhistory.co.uk. Um, so yeah, there's lots of articles on there. I've not, I've not updated it much this year at all, but there's, there's, there's articles on there going back to about 2014. Um, there's hundreds of articles on there that I've written over the years. Okay, so there's that. As you said right at the beginning, I've written eight books. They're on my Amazon page on Amazon dot wherever you are, com.co.uk.ca, whatever. Um, 
so just key my name into the search engine on, on Amazon and it will bring me up. Don't com- There's a, another John Hamer author on there. I think he's a priest or something. I'm not sure. but So don't confuse me with him. Uh, but yeah, you, you, you'll see my picture on there anyway. So, um, And the other thing is I've got my own BitChute channel as well, which is um, John Hamer official. So, you know, those are the, the kind of the three main areas where you can find my work. Awesome. And Mark, what about you, brother? Uh, I know attention spans are limited, so just go into any search engine and type in Flat Earth Mark. Ooh, there you go. Find <laughs> my stuff somewhere. And, and my contact info is out there everywhere. You can literally go into any search engine and just type in Mark Sargent's email address, Mark Sargent's phone number, Mark Sargent's um, social security number. You'll, you'll find it. Awesome, man. Well, gentlemen, we appreciate you being on. Uh, for everyone out there listening, uh, just uh, like we always say, just we're, we're, we're we bring people on so that you can learn about something new, uh, potentially something you didn't know before, or at least the very minimum research on your own if it's something that interests you. And no one ever asks everybody to believe everything that we say on any of our shows. We always just tell people this is an encouragement to you to look in to see what's really going on in this world because a lot of cases is not what, what we think it is. And that, that's starting to come to the surface in a massive way right now. Um, this Great Awakening is uh, it's an exciting time to be alive for sure. And um, so, guys, we appreciate you being on here. Also, uh, don't forget if you're new to the podcast um and you're not aware that we also have a live tv show now that we're doing called liberty monks live and that's on freedomfirst.tv and we air on mondays and wednesdays at nine o'clock um you can also subscribe to that network which is uh, a great opportunity to see all the different shows that are there the whole archives and everything that they have and if you use the code monks you get a a discount of 25 percent on your subscription so um if that's something that interests you we have a lot of fun on there and have a lot of great content to share with everybody about the things that are going on in this world and uh, the people that are in the know regarding it so um that being said uh john mark god bless you guys it's great to see you guys again it was awesome to have you on um and we appreciate your time and then uh hey god bless everybody out there listening we appreciate you more than you know and as always god bless america and god bless uh, the UK too, I guess, John. We're going to God bless you, you too, there, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure as always. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks, and uh, and uh, uh, ever, till next time, be safe and well, everybody, and have a great evening.